Molecular orbital theory continued. We're now going to extend our discussion to include molecular orbitals that are formed from combining p orbitals to form sigma and pi molecular orbitals. Remember our discussion of wave interference in the last video? If not, you should definitely go watch it now. But as a brief summary, waves can interfere destructively and constructively depending on how their phases interact. When we combine our atomic wave functions to make molecular orbitals, we will get bonding and antibonding orbitals depending on how these wave functions interact. One more quick review from last time. You can always go back to the other video if you need it in more detail, since this is a fast review version. We started by combining s orbitals, since these are the simplest to see. When we combine two atomic orbitals constructively, we get a lower energy orbital with a bonding density with electron density mostly between the nuclei. This is called a bonding orbital. If we interfere them destructively, we end up with an orbital where most of the electron density is outside of the area between the two nuclei. And we call this an antibonding orbital since electrons that are added to this pull the nuclei apart rather than together. They were both named sigma because they were symmetrical along the bond axis. And we added a subscript that told us that they came from the 1s orbital. We can do the identical things to p orbitals now. Now let's remember our steps to making an MO diagram. First, we drew the atomic orbital diagrams along the side and wrote in our valence electron. We already know how to do this. Then we take the valence electrons from each atom and we fill into the appropriate molecular orbital diagram from low energy to high. These molecular orbital diagrams are calculated using a computer program, and we just give you the results. So far, we've only went through the sigma that comes from the 1 and 2s orbitals. Now we'll be able to move on to more complicated ones. Pauli exclusion, Hund's and Aufbau principles still apply. So two electrons per orbitals with opposite spins. And if you have orbitals that have the same energy level, you fill across the energy levels first and then duplicate. We can now go more in detail about our p orbitals and our appropriate molecular orbital diagram for those. There's two different ways that we can overlap orbitals when we're talking about p orbitals. We can overlap them end on end, or we can overlap them side on side. Before we get into this too much, let's think about why this is. If we have two atoms, both with p orbitals, and we line them up, we can see that these can overlap like this. However, if we do that, our other orbitals will not be able to overlap like that because they are on the wrong plane. And so instead, we'll get what we call side-on-side -side overlap, like this. Now, you can see also that we, this would happen one other place, but it's gonna make the drawing messy if I do it. But our last set of p orbitals would also overlap side-on-side, -side, and those would just overlap coming into and out of the screen. When they overlap end on end, they form sigma and sigma star orbitals, just like when we overlapped the s orbitals. They look a little bit different though, because they're not just spheres that are overlapping. They're these two lobes. And when these two lobes overlap, they can overlap two different ways, constructively or destructively, just like the s orbitals. And they form two different shapes depending on how they interact. So let's look at our constructive first. If we overlap with constructive interference, you can see that we get a bonding orbital because if our nuclei are right here, we see most of our electron density is in our center. Yeah, sure, there's a little bit out here, but most is in the center. Now, if we look at what happens when we interfere them destructively, and you see that our two nuclei would be here, most of our electron density is actually on the outsides of our nuclei, which means if we have electrons in the antibonding orbital, they subtract from the bond order. Notice, just like with the s orbitals, we started with two atomic orbitals, we ended with two molecular orbitals. Now, as we talked about a second ago, 
This only happens once, and that's because of the way that the geometry works. However, our other p orbitals can also overlap, and if those overlap, they're going to do so as a different shape. This two-lobed structure that we have here, and that has a different symmetry. That symmetry we call a pi. Whenever we overlap the orbitals side on side, we also can get constructive or destructive interference. If you overlap them side on side constructively, you get this. Notice that there's two lobes and that if our nuclei are here and here, most of our electron density is actually between the two nuclei. Now you might say, but wait, there's two lobes above and below the nuclei. Well, yes, that's, that's true, but they're still holding the nuclei together. They're still pulling it toward each other. Compare that to the antibonding orbitals, where if your nuclei are here and here, you see that most of your electron density is outside of the nuclei, and that causes it to be an antibonding orbital. So once again, we combine two atomic orbitals, we get two molecular orbitals. Now this will also be able to happen again in the other dimension. And so because it can happen again in the other dimension, oftentimes you'll see this as actually combining four atomic orbitals to get four molecular orbitals. But it's the same idea. The number of atomic orbitals that you start with is the number of molecular orbitals that you end with. So as a quick summary here, we have three different p orbitals. When you form bonds, the first one will overlap end on end, which is what we have here, and that causes you to have a sigma bond. The other two orbitals will need to overlap side on side, and that has a different symmetry, and we call that a pi symmetry. Notice that we still have a star when we have antibonding orbitals, and we still have our little subscripts that tell us where the orbitals originally came from. So total, we started with six atomic orbitals, three p's from one of them, three p's from the other. We ended with six molecular orbitals. But what about the energies of these? Are they all the same? We know from the, when we talked about the s orbitals that when we combine them to form sigma that our antibonding and bonding weren't the same. And that's gonna be true here. Our antibondings are gonna be higher. But what about sigma versus pi? Is one energy level higher than the other? Well, it turns out they are. And whether the sigma is higher than the pi or the pi is higher than the sigma actually depends on what diatomic molecules you're talking about. And so we need to be able to say, okay, what are these energy levels? Now, the computer programs that we use to calculate this by using the wave functions tell us the orderings of them. When you get to lab, you'll get to do this and you'll get to see actual numbers. We're gonna do it very qualitatively. So here I have nitrogen and oxygen. We'll see why I picked those in a minute. I've already shown you the S orbitals because those don't change from the last video. So I already went ahead and wrote these in. Now we need to look at our sigma and pi that is caused from our P orbitals though. That's the new part of this video as compared to the last one. So our s orbitals are gonna be the same as before. Now for our p orbitals, we have two different possibilities depending on what we're talking, which atoms we're talking about. And in the next slide, I'll show you how to tell which one's which. In this case, I've just shown you one of each. In both cases, our antibonding orbitals are going to have our sigma higher than our pi. That's gonna be true for any of our homonuclear diatomics that we talk about. But look at what happens to the bonding orbitals. They switch. And we'll talk about why this is on the next slide as well, but for now, just see the difference. In one case, sigma is higher than pi, and in the other case, pi is higher than sigma. Notice that for both our antibonding and our bonding pi's, we have two. That's because we did, the side-on-side -side overlap two different times with two different set of p orbitals. These are structures that you're going to need to remember how this basic setup works. Yes, it's memorization, but it's not too bad. Notice our electrons we fill in as before. We have one, two, 
three, four, five electrons here. One, two, three, four, five electrons here. So we had a total of 10 electrons. And in here we fill in two, four, six, eight, 10 electrons. Over on the oxygen, if you count up our valence electrons, we had 12. And if you count up our electrons that are in the center, we also have 12. So that's the same as before, the same as for atomic orbitals. You start at your lowest energy and you fill up. We obey Hund's and Aufbau's principle here because these are the same energy. And so we fill across before we start filling up our orbitals, just like when we filled into our p orbitals in the atomic energy level diagrams. All the rules for electrons are the same. The new part is this an inside structure of the molecular orbital diagram. Now, don't, don't let this slide overwhelm you. We've actually already done two of these. So let's look at nitrogen. And oxygen. The reason why I picked these two to do on the last slide was because this actually is where the switch in the sigma and the pi occurs. We're not going to spend too much time on the reasonings for why in some cases the sigma is higher than the pi, in some cases the pi is higher than the sigma. Just know that it has to do with mixing between the s and the p orbitals. For boron, carbon, and nitrogen, this means that the sigma is higher than the pi. However, for the oxygen, fluorine, and neon, the sigma is lower than for the pi. You do have to memorize this setup. You should be able to give me the diatomic, the homonuclear diatomic molecular orbital structure for these second rows. But it's not that bad to memorize because all you have to do is know the basic structure of the inside. Remember, we already know how to do the atomic energy level diagrams. You've already done this previously. The new part is this middle. The last video, we learned how the 2s part works. And in this video, we learned how the 2p part works. We know why the nomenclature is like it is between the sigma and the pi. We know why there are two pi's, right? Because there are two overlapping p orbitals that make those. And now we just have to memorize that for boron, carbon, and nitrogen, our sigma is higher than our pi. And that for the others, it reverses. For oxygen, fluorine, and neon, our sigma is lower than our pi. Notice the antibondings all stay the same, so we don't have to worry about memorizing those. We've got that. And then the electrons, of course, just come from filling in low to high, low to high, following all the rules that we already know. So as good practice, you should go and try to recreate all of these from scratch. without looking at anything. You should be able to remember how to do all of the nomenclature, all of the orderings, and all of the electrons. Now that we have these, let's do bond order for each one. We'll walk through this relatively quickly since we did it in the last video, but it's a good practice to go through. So remember, for bond order, it is half times the bonding electrons minus the antibonding. So here we have four bonding, two antibonding, so we've got one. Four minus two is two divided by two is one. For carbon, we have two, four, six bonding and two antibonding. And so we're left with a bond order of two. For nitrogen, we have eight bonding electrons and just two antibonding. And so we have a bond order of 3. 8 minus 2 is 6, divided by 2 is 3.
At this point, you should definitely take a moment and try to do oxygen, fluorine, and neon on your own before continuing the video. For oxygen, we have eight bonding electrons, but now we have four antibonding, which gives us a bond order of two. For fluorine, we have our eight bonding orbitals just like before, or eight electrons like before, but now we have six antibonding, giving us a bond order of one. And our last one, we have eight bonding, eight antibonding, and so we get a bond order of zero. As you are going through these orbitals, as you are going through making these molecular orbital diagrams, there are definitely some things you need to remember. So first off, did you label all the atomic orbitals? A lot of people forget these should be labeled just like when we drew them on their own. Next, did you label all the molecular orbitals? Don't forget all of the molecular orbitals need to be labeled with the star, the subscript, and either the sigma or pi depending on their symmetry. Did you remember to add the star to your antibonding orbitals? That's part of the label, it has to be there. Did you add or subtract electrons as appropriate if you have an ion? I'm adding this here even though we haven't talked about it yet. Next video we're going to do ions. And did you use the proper orbitals for the orbit the proper order for the orbitals for the MOs? What I mean by that is is your sigma versus pi orbital for your 2p orbitals in the correct order. So is your sigma lower than your pi or is your pi lower than your sigma? Make sure you double check that each time and make sure that you pick the right one. So in this video, we've walked through how to make MO diagrams when our atoms have valence P orbitals that we need to combine to make our molecular orbitals. We saw that they can combine two different ways, end on end, which creates a sigma orbital, or side on side, which creates pi orbitals. We saw the energy levels of those. We saw how there are bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. And we practice how to make the atomic, and we practice how to make the molecular energy level diagrams for all of the second row homonuclear diatomics. We also reviewed bond order by determining the bond order for each one.